Uh, big thank you to NCJFCJ for hosting the webinar today for us. Um, if you are joining in for the first time today, my name is Jennifer Landheis. I am the Director of the Stalking Prevention Awareness and Resource Center. Um, and this is the third in a series of three uh, webinars that we have been hosting, primarily targeting those of you that receive um, the Improving Criminal Justice Response Grant from the Office on Violence Against Women. So if you aren't familiar with SPARC, we are funded by the Office on Violence Against Women uh, to provide training and technical assistance um, specific to the issue of stalking. And you can find more information about SPARC on our website, which is stalkingawareness.org. Um, as I go through this website, I would also like to take a minute to introduce my esteemed wonderful colleague, uh, Jen Dolly from the Equitas side of the house. Um, if you're not familiar, SPARC happens to sit in Equitas, um, and I will let Jen introduce Equitas as well as her role. Um, go ahead, Jen. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, I am Jen Dolly, and I am an attorney advisor with Equitas. Um, Equitas is a resource for prosecutors, law enforcement, and other allied professionals. Um, and we are um, available, we provide uh, resources um, on our website um, on all types of cases, but um, really focusing on intimate partner violence, human trafficking, um, and sexual assault cases. And so we have plenty of resources on all sorts of different topics. Um, and we also provide training and technical assistance around the country, like part of what we're doing today and, and working with um, Spark to do so. Um, and uh, we are available for consultations. So if you have questions that come up, um, whether you're a prosecutor or whether you're law enforcement and, and working on these types of cases, um, whether it is a trial strategy or a legal issue, or um, you're looking for kind of a peer-to-peer -peer connect, we have connections all through the country um, and have access to a lot of different resources to connect you with. So that's generally what we do. Um, and feel free to reach out and um, check out our website. Thanks so much, Jen. So just quickly in the chat, some of you have already started and I really appreciate it. We asked you to tell us a little bit about um, the work that you do and what jurisdiction you're representing. So I see a couple of familiar names in the chat um, from the previous webinars that we've done the last couple of weeks. We are recording these webinars. We're gonna make them available to the program managers um, at the Office on Violence Against Women to be able to distribute to those ICJR grantees. And then we'll also be posting these on the SPARC website as well, with the exception of the use of technology one that we did last week, um, just because we don't want to educate offenders on how to better stalk victims, um, but we can get you access to that if you email us. So for those of you that aren't familiar with SPARC, just really quickly, I wanna highlight some of the resources that we have available on our website. In particular, two things that I think you will find extremely helpful for this particular webinar. So um, we have practitioner guides on our website. So for those of you that are law enforcement and prosecution specific to this webinar, we have a prosecutor's guide on stalking on the website. We also have some checklists and overviews on how to conduct thorough investigations for law enforcement. And then of course, for all of you who are victim advocacy folks, and I see quite a few of you putting your information in the chat, we also have advocacy guides on the website as well. So everything that's on the website is free for you to use. You can download it um, and use it in the work that you're doing um, to enhance offender accountability and improve the uh, safety of victims. And all of that's possible thanks to the funding that we get from the Office on Violence Against Women. So I would also encourage you to sign up for our newsletter, just because in the newsletter, we announce a lot of our upcoming trainings um, and the webinars that we do quarterly that are available to all of you who are grantees or potential grantees. So take a moment to sign up for the website and then follow us on social media. We are gearing up already for Domestic Violence Awareness Month in October, and then of course, Stalking Awareness Month in the month of January. So follow us on social media, and we look forward to engaging with all of you. So for those of you that have joined us the past couple of webinars, the, these first couple of slides, you might be like, oh, we already covered that last time, but we always have a different audience on all of our webinars. And we want to make sure that we are building that similar foundation in all of our webinars about how do we address the stalking within the work that we're doing as law enforcement, as prosecutors, and of course, as advocacy folks. And so what we're going to operate from today, because we have people joining us from all across the country, is the behavioral definition of stalking, which will be familiar to most of you because there are components contained in pretty much every single state statute um, that says that stalking's a pattern of behavior 
or as it's probably referred to in your state statute, a course of conduct that's directed at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to either fear for their safety or the safety of someone else or to experience substantial emotional distress. That definition should also be familiar to you. Um, I see a couple of you saying that you're working in college campuses. So that's also the definition that Title IX uses and that we use in our campus work as well. So hopefully it's one that's familiar to all of you. But the one thing that we do wanna spend a little bit more time on when we look at this particular definition is understanding that when we look at stalking crime, that emotional distress and reasonable fear that people experience differs greatly depending on the context of that particular situation. And what can be really hard about stalking crimes is those of us that are responders, especially law enforcement and prosecutors, we're often getting one piece of a bigger puzzle. And we have to try to put those pieces of the puzzle together to build our case. And oftentimes we're relying on traumatized victims to help us put those pieces of the puzzle together. So Jen and I are gonna talk a little bit about some strategies today that can help you build those cases. And as Jen mentioned, please, please, please reach out to us for technical assistance. If you're working on a case and you could use another set of eyes or you're thinking, you know what, I would really like to run by some scenarios with someone else. That's what we're here for. I can only speak for myself, but I would guess for Jen too, some of our favorite parts of the job to be able to help you um, enhance the safety of victims and be able to work on these cases. So please reach out to us um, if you have specific questions about your state's practices. But one of the things that we want to consider today is that context in stalking cases. And so when we look at stalking behaviors, one of the things that we know oftentimes is that fear and emotional distress can be difficult to determine. And it's one of the things that we need in proving our cases and moving those cases forward. But oftentimes we don't have victims who may articulate fear. They may not be able to articulate the emotional distress that they're feeling because a lot of times that response to the offender's behavior is based on the context of the relationship with the offender, is based on past activities. And the thing that we need to remember is fear is really subjective. And so one of the things that we wanna consider is that everyone reacts to different things and fears different things. And I'm curious if any of you on the webinar are willing to admit, even though we just met, that you are afraid of spiders. You can raise your hand or put in the chat. Anybody afraid of spiders? <laughs> I see some I see some thumbs up going, going across. Okay, thank you, Graciela and others who are saying, yeah, that's me. So I want you to look at this particular video and see if you would react like the female in this video or if you would react like the male in this video to this particular situation. So that buffered for me. I don't know if it buffered for anybody else. So we're gonna play it again. There we go. Okay. Now that you all got to see the video, how many of you are gonna react like the female and jump on the back of the couch? Anyone? <laughs> Chris Elba says me. absolutely. <laughs> Same. <laughs> okay, how many of you are gonna react like the male? Like, really? It's a spider, let's get a shoe, let's scoop it up, put it back outside. Yeah, a couple of you say, <laughs> some of you are changing the scenario already and saying if it was a roach, I would be in a different position. So you can see all of us are reacting differently to this particular situation. And some of us are saying, I would react like the female. Other of us are like, no, it's not a big deal. But I'm wondering if you would change your opinion about this particular reaction of the female. Because I'm betting many of you would say maybe the female overreacted a little bit, like it's a little over the top. Now, those of us that are really afraid of spiders are like, absolutely not. We can burn the house down with fire and it's okay. But some of you are saying mm, the female re -over overreacted a little bit, but what if I told you this female had actually been bitten by a poisonous spider before and had an allergic reaction and as a result is extremely afraid of spiders? Now, are we judging her reaction a little bit differently based on some of the information that I gave you? Most people are gonna say, yeah, it's a little bit more understandable now that we have some of that background information.
And one of the things that we need to be thinking about is that's exactly applicable to stalking cases. Oftentimes, those of us that are on the outside looking at someone's reaction might say, that's a little over the top, or maybe it's being blown out of proportion, or I don't understand what the big deal is because we don't understand the context. And what I did in this particular situation is just give you the context of why this particular female was so afraid of the spider. But in stalking cases, we oftentimes fail to get that context. And understanding that context is really important because oftentimes there's things that are frightening to a victim that don't mean anything to the rest of us. The perfect example is a victim getting flowers at their place of employment. And everyone else is like, oh, that's so sweet. And a victim's terrified. And they may make a call to law enforcement and say, I got flowers from the person that I have a civil protection order against. And then law enforcement may say, mm, that's not really contacting. We don't really know that it was from the offender because the card wasn't signed. I don't really understand what the big deal is. There was no threat here. And without understanding what those flowers meant to the victim, we may or may not have a situation where people react to the victim, they don't take a report, the victim's uh, case doesn't go forward in the criminal justice system. And so we have to remember that oftentimes in stalking cases, there's behaviors that happen that have a specific meaning to a victim that don't have any meaning to anybody else. And the other thing that we have to remember, particular to those of you who are law enforcement and prosecutors, is that oftentimes in stalking crimes, we are criminalizing non-criminal events. It is not criminal to send somebody a text message or drive down a public street, unless that may be happening within the context of a stalking crime. And so one of the things that happens oftentimes in stalking cases is we get given one piece of the puzzle and we are trying to make a determination on whether we have a case, whether we can hold somebody accountable, what we can do with this particular situation without having access to all the other information that a victim might have, that other people within the criminal justice system might have, that a victim might advocate may have. And so we're left with just that one piece of the puzzle. And so one of the things that what we want to encourage you to do, especially as we look at building these particular cases, is really taking the time and energy to put those pieces of the puzzle together. Because these are long resource intensive investigations and they are not easy, you know, uh, cases that we can work on um, and push through the criminal justice system. And so in thinking about that, we want you to think about who is it that you're working with to help build these cases? How are you having those interactions with victims? Are they trauma informed? Are you getting the information that you need? And in instances where we aren't able to do anything criminally, how are we supporting victims to be able to continue to participate in the criminal justice system when things happen again? Because in stalking crimes, they will happen again. It's only a matter of time. But if we are working with a victim, who no longer trusts us, who doesn't believe that we have their best interest in place, it's gonna be difficult for them to wanna to participate going forward. And so keeping all of those things in mind as we build our stalking case is really important. And I'm sure there's not a single one of us on this particular call who is over-resourced, overpaid, <laughs> and doesn't have enough to do, right? Or if you are, can you private message me? Cause then maybe I wanna have more <laughs> <transaction>. <laughs> But most of us are in the same position, right? So we're using uh, and working on cases where we don't have a lot of resources, we don't have a lot of time, and we're trying to build these things as we move forward. The other thing that we see in stalking cases as compared to domestic violence and sexual assault cases is a lot of times when we go to do training, people are like, well, I appreciate the training, Jennifer, but we just don't really have that many stalking cases. And we hear from our colleagues at OVW who are saying, you know, progress reports, et cetera, are saying, this particular jurisdiction worked with three stalking cases and 3,000 domestic violence cases. And I'm always a little curious about that because we actually know the prevalence rates of stalking affect one in three women and one in six men at some point in their lifetime. So those prevalence rates are just as high as domestic violence and sexual assault. But I'm guessing that there's not a single one of us on this particular webinar who would say that our caseload for stalking cases is just as high as our caseload for domestic violence and sexual assault. 
Is there anybody on the webinar who has just as high number of caseload with stalking cases? If you fail, put it in the chat because <laughs> we want to talk to you. <laughs> we want to know what you're doing right in your jurisdiction. Because one of the things that we know is despite the high prevalence rates, we are not seeing those same number of victims reaching out for victim services or accessing the criminal justice system. And one of the things that we know is that while a majority of victims of stalking know their offender in some capacity, what we also know is that oftentimes the stalking isn't being reported. We have systems set up that don't necessarily screen in stalking victims, but rather screen them out. And that oftentimes when we're working with victims, they feel like no one's listening. They feel like nothing is happening in their particular case. And we have that kind of justification of, we have these cases going on, they aren't being reported by victims. And when they are, when they're landing in our hands, what are we doing with them? Are they being screened in or screened out? And one of the things that we know happens a lot of times is many of the responses to stalking across the country are based in the response to domestic violence, which is a good thing because we've come a long way when it comes to our response to domestic violence. However, we know that only about 43% of female and 32% of male victims are being stalked by a current or former intimate partner. That means more than half are not being stalked by a current intimate partner. So in jurisdictions that are saying, we're really working to enhance our response to stalking, people say things like, well, if the case comes into law enforcement, it goes to our crimes against persons unit, or it goes to our domestic violence unit, or it goes to our domestic violence prosecutor. What if it's not a domestic violence case? What if it comes in as somebody slashed someone else's tires? And it probably comes in as a property crime. No one identifies that it might be a pattern of behavior that's directed at a stalking victim. And we don't identify it as a stalking case until something happens again and again and again. And unfortunately, by this time, many victims of stalking have lost faith in the criminal justice system, do not feel like they wanna to continue to participate going forward and are frustrated with the fact that nobody's listening to them. I'm curious, if. Uh, uh, those of you on the call have heard things like, well, do I have to wait until somebody hurts me before anybody will do anything? Why is it not stopping behaviors now until it escalates to the point where I think this person's going to harm me? And so one of the things that we have to be thinking about is as we go forward in these particular cases, how are we screening victims in and out of services? And so for those of you that are like, well, I'm a victim advocate, of course I would work with a victim of stalking. We hear from victims of stalking all across the country who say, I couldn't get into shelter because I wasn't being stalked by an intimate partner. I couldn't qualify for a support group, for a civil protection order, for ongoing crisis intervention because I wasn't being stalked by somebody I knew. And so one of the things that we wanna be thinking about is how do these particular calls come in and how are we assisting all victims of stalking, not just intimate partner victims of stalking. The other thing that we wanna be thinking about is we know that one of the reasons that we fail to see lots of stalking cases within the criminal justice system is number one, offenders are very adept at what they're doing. And number two, we don't necessarily understand what constitutes stalking. And both victims and those of us that are responders have a pretty stereotypical definition and understanding of what we think stalking behaviors are. And one of the things that we know is people often say to us, okay, so how do we deal with the offenders who do come into the system? What kind of treatment, how, what does sentencing look like? How do we hold these offenders accountable? And one of the things that we struggle with is we don't really understand what motivates stalkers to stalk. Some of them are doing it because um, they have affection for the victim. Many of them are doing it out of power and control because it is an intimate partner situation. Some offenders are doing it because they become obsessed with the victim. Um, they want to continue a relationship. They want revenge for the victim breaking up with them. Um, others are doing it as part of a crime. And that's one of the connections that we see with sexual assault. So those offenders who are committing sexual assault are oftentimes engaging in stalking beh behavior prior to the sexual assault, along with human trafficking behaviors that are often present um, and stalking goes into those human trafficking, recruitment, behaviors, containment behaviors, et cetera. So be thinking as, oh, go ahead, Jen. 
I was just going to say, and also uh, post a crime occurring, right? So, and kind of as, you know, within human trafficking, it can be part of an, uh, part of the ongoing crime, right? Like creating that, um, playing on that sense of vulnerability and exploiting those, those vulnerabilities to really intimidate someone to, and to isolate someone even more. And also, you know, in sexual assault cases, um, post a sexual assault, there may be a lot of communications um, about this, you know, that that seem innocuous, but that can uh, really show um, an attempt to intimidate that victim um, into maybe not not reporting or to not thinking something really happened or whatever that motivation might be. But it can it can occur afterwards as well. And I think in a lot of the discussions that we have with folks across the country, Jen, I think we see people make that connection intuitively. They're like, oh yeah, we, we definitely understand that it happens with sexual assault. We get it that it happens with human trafficking. We get it that, that it happens with domestic violence. But whether we name it as stalking, whether we prove it as stalking are two different things, right? Exactly. Our, our theme for Stalking Awareness Month is always know it, name it, stop it, which seems pretty simple. <laughs> But knowing it and naming it, um, it are often the two things that we really struggle with in both the criminal justice system and in society as large as well. And one of that leads us into thinking about how is it that we define stalking? And a lot of times when we ask people, so what is stalking exactly? People say, well, it's when someone's following you around, when they're looking at your social media, when they won't leave you alone, when they just happen to show up at Walmart. And most people name what we call the surveillance category of behaviors. And if you don't take anything away from this webinar, but this one thing, we hope you take more than that. <laughs> but if you only take away this, we'd really like you to encourage, encourage you to think about this particular framework that we call the SLY framework. And it stands for surveillance, life invasion, interference, and intimidation. And this framework was developed by Dr. T.K. Logan out of the University of Kentucky after decades of working with stalking victims and helping trying to frame what it looks like. I kind of think of the SLY framework as like the power and control wheel of stalking. It helps you identify the different behaviors that happen in a particular situation beyond just the stereotypical classical stalking behaviors. And so what we see happen in lots of stalking cases is that when the surveillance behavior is happening, and we gave you some examples here on this slide where the offender is following somebody, they're showing up, they're using some kind of tracking software, they're engaging in what we call proxy stalking, which means they're using a third party to stalk the victim, usually a friend, a family member, a buddy, somebody like that. When that's occurring, victims are more likely to identify that they're being stalked, and they're more likely to come forward and make that report to either victim services or to law enforcement. And as professionals, when that's happening, we are more likely to move those cases forward through the criminal justice system. If surveillance behavior is happening, these are the cases that are moving forward. But we miss the life invasion, the intimidations. <laughs> Somebody said sending their flying monkeys to intimidate. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's a really great example. Um, and I'm going to feel that one, Sherry, uh, with your permission. And then the interference part of things, where we have an offender who's ruining a victim's reputation. Um, they're uh, showing up someplace like the gym where the victim's at and causing a scene and not allowing the victim to leave. And the victim's like, I don't want to cause a scene here. I'll talk to you later. And what we know is when these behaviors are happening, victims oftentimes do not understand or articulate this as stalking. And what we know from the research is if you ask a victim of stalking, are you being stalked? Most of the time they're going to say no. But if you say to them and describe the behaviors that you see on your screen, if you say, is somebody trying to obtain information about you? Is somebody showing up unwanted? Have they humiliated you in public? Are they invading your property? Then victims say yes. But they didn't understand that as stalking. And frankly, we didn't either oftentimes as responders. And so if you are a law enforcement officer or a prosecutor and you are working to build a course of conduct or a pattern of behavior, the more incidents that you have, the better your case is. But you're not gonna know about those incidents unless you ask specific questions about the behaviors that are listed on this slide. Because if you just say, are there other, any other stalking or harassment behaviors that the offender is engaging in, victims will say no. We have to give them examples of what's been occurring. And oftentimes, I never fail to, fail to be surprised when I've been working with a victim of stalking and we've gone in to, to do a law enforcement report or something like that. And 
I know there's a bunch of information that they aren't bringing forward to the law enforcement officer. And I'll say later things like, well, I'm curious why you didn't mention that to the detective. And the victim will say, because they didn't ask me. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we have to be thinking about as prosecutors and as law enforcement, but as victim advocates too, is how are we identifying all the things that happen in a stalking situation? We also give you some examples of what that looks like when offenders are using technology in those same situations. So are they surveilling the victim through GPS? Do they have cameras set up? Um, are they hacking into a victim's account? Are they trying to blackmail or sex toward a victim? Are they um, threatening to harm them online? Are they uh, threatening to post intimate images of them? All these particular hate behaviors are typically happening in a stalking case. And I can tell you, I have never been I've never been, I've never failed <laughs> to be surprised at the number of things that are happening in a stalking case that weren't disclosed to me immediately unless I asked specific questions about them. So one of the things that we would encourage you as a takeaway from today, and we will post at the PowerPoint in the chat for you all, is to start using this SLI framework to frame your questions. For those of you that are law enforcement on our website, are these behaviors identified um, in a handout that you can use as a checklist when you're doing your investigations? So under our law enforcement um, section, there's questions to be able to ask prosecutors. I would encourage you to use that same resource um, and ask those specific questions of victims because you will have lots more information that you can use um, and things that you might be able to enter into evidence that you didn't know about. All right. The other thing that we want to make a parent. And for those of you, um, especially victim advocates that are like, mm, yeah, the slide framework is helpful, but it's more helpful to like, you know, law enforcement or to prosecutors. One of the things that we know is that offenders oftentimes use more than one means of approach. And they're typically gonna change up their approaches based on the reaction from the victim, but sometimes based on the reaction from those of us as responders. So if, as a prosecutor, there's a no contact order that's been put in place or the victim applies for a civil protection order and the court has forbid the offender from telephoning, contacting, or communicating, then we know offenders oftentimes do things like drive down a public street, right? Oh, I, I didn't have any contact. I didn't see the victim. And when offenders are constantly changing their behaviors, using the SLI framework helps us figure out what they might do next and helps us better safety plan with victims talking about what may happen next. Because oftentimes what happens in stalking cases is people safety plan about what has been happening, not about what might happen now. And we know our offenders change their behaviors so frequently. Oftentimes people working in a stalking case may say things like, okay, Jen, if you're being stalked, why don't you just change your phone number so the offender can't call you anymore? If Jen changes her phone number and I call her and it says, I'm sorry, this number has been disconnected. Do I, as the stalker say, oh darn, I guess I'm gonna give up stalking Jen and I just move on with my life. Does that ever happen in anyone's stalking cases? It's never happened to any of mine. I don't, I don't know about the rest of you. But oftentimes people say to victims, change your phone number, just get offline, et cetera. And what we see happen is if I'm stalking Jen, I know where Jen lives, I know where she works. I know where she hangs out. And if I can't reach her by phone, I show up in person. And or so you know, now, go or, ahead. You know, family, or, you know, family members and friends and you know where else to go and who else to contact. Um, and I think you make such an important point about, um, about thinking about safety planning and really working with the victim to figure out you, especially in cases of, of intimate partner stalking, um, you know, they know the, the offender the best, right? They, they, they are going to be the best source of information as to what, um, what that person might do next or think of doing next. And safety planning is, you know, I think sometimes as a prosecutor, I was like, I thought I knew what I, what that person would need or what would safety look like for them? Or what does that, what does that mean? Oh, just change your phone number. Well, that's, that's not really, you know, that's asking some, just changing your phone number. I mean, how many of us have had the same phone number for so long, right? It's actually like, it's a big ask, right? Or just not being online. Those are big asks. And, and so there's ways to think about what's really um, important for that person and, and what does safety look like for them. So really working with, with, um, with a victim to discuss in that kind of trauma informed way is so important as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things that we oftentimes fail to do in stalking cases is look at safety from that emotional standpoint. 
it's always a little curious to me when pe we talk about safety planning with domestic violence, people get the emotional safety planning, access to counseling, support, in empowerment. But then when we talk about safety planning with stalking victims, people default to get somebody to walk you back and forth to your car. Or do you have a lock on your door? Or do you have lights outside your residence? Which are important, absolutely. And we forget about the emotional and psychological impact that stalking has as well. And so we have to remember to use those same skills that we've developed in our domestic violence and sexual assault cases to also be able to use those skills in our stalking cases. And then you let us right into the connection with intimate partner violence. And one of the things that we also want to encourage you to start thinking about is if you are prosecuting a lot of domestic violence cases or you're investigating or working on domestic violence cases, is to identify those stalking behaviors that happen within the context of intimate partner violence. And one of the big aha moments um, we often have in these particular cases is when we have a victim who's still in a domestic violence relationship with the offender, and the offender is really controlling, they're really jealous, they're monitoring the victim's social media, they're not allowing the victim to go anywhere, they disrupt their job, et cetera we have all kind of packaged that in with the intimidation, with the minimization, with the coercive control that happens in domestic violence. And then when the victim leaves the offender and the offender is monitoring their social media and showing up at their job, et cetera, then people are like, okay, well now we have a stalking case. The behavior didn't change. When the victim was still with the offender and the offender was following them, they were monitoring what they were doing, they were really controlling, they were really jealous, they were really possessive. Is that not also a course of conduct directed at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to feel fear? It's also stalking, but we never called it that, right? All of us would say, oh yeah, well, we know it intersects with domestic violence, but do we approach it that way? Do we investigate it that way? Do we charge it that way and think about charging stalking in addition to our domestic violence charges? And oftentimes we don't. And some of you might be saying, well, what does it matter? I mean, if we charge domestic violence or if we charge stalking, like what's, what's the point? As long as we're holding the offender accountable in some way. And while I agree with that, one of the things that we also have to be thinking about is our intimate partner stalkers are very dangerous. They escalate really quickly. They're much more likely to use weapons. And these are offenders who do not stop. They are going to continue to do what they do over and over and over again, despite the civil protection order, despite the criminal no contact order, despite putting them in jail, they will continue to reoffend. And one of the things that we know is in domestic violence cases where there is also stalking, those are some of our most dangerous cases. And we know that in 85% of attempted and 76% of completed intimate partner femicides, where a male offender has killed a female victim, there has been an episode of stalking within the year prior to the murder. But if we never identified it, if we never called it stalking, how were we supposed to safety plan and how were we supposed to help hold these particular offenders accountable? And across the country, people are working on reducing domestic violence homicides. And they oftentimes focus training on things like strangulation, if the victim's pregnant, if the offender has access to weapons. And don't get me wrong, those are all really great things. We absolutely should be focusing on those. But what people miss all the time is the connection with stalking. Stalking's the number eight lethality risk in intimate partner homicides. If you have domestic violence plus stalking, you have some of your most dangerous cases. But if we never called it stalking and we never safety planned with victims around that stalking, then we miss the opportunity to intervene in some of our most dangerous cases. And, and I would also argue, oh, go ahead, Jen. I'm, I'm so sorry. I was just going to add too, for prosecutors and law enforcement, many, I mean, obviously it's, it's very jurisdiction specific, but in many cases, um, if there's a prior conviction for stalking um, and we know people are going to reoffend, whether it's the same victim or, or another victim, uh, many times that second, it's, it's you know, what we call kind of a bump up, right? It increases the penalties and increases the level of crime if someone has that prior conviction for stalking. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just articulating the word stalking also sometimes helps give victims the language that they need when they make reports, right? Exactly. So if they're talking about everything that's been happening, if they're be able to actually use the word stalking or harassment, 
that can be helpful as well. And so one of the things we want you to start thinking about is when you're working on domestic violence cases, intuitively, we all probably know that stalking is happening, but are we naming it and are we safety planning around it, I think is really important. The other thing that we wanna be thinking about, um, so somebody said, how do you safety plan with victims who don't recognize that they're being stalked? So perfect leading question, uh, Derica. I feel like I should you know, send you some kind of gold star. You set me up for the next slide, which is how do we screen for stalking within domestic violence? Because people often have, have that question. How do we help victims understand that they're being stalked? So we actually have four screening questions that we took from a lethality assessment that we're gonna show you in just a second um, that help you articulate what stalking is. And so asking victims, is there somebody that's following or monitoring you in any way? Um, have they invaded your life or privacy by making unwanted contact with you? Um, are they interfering with um, you being able to leave a certain situation? Are they like holding you against your will? Um, have they attacked other people, your friends, your pets? Or have they on more than one time intimidated or scared you through some kind of threats or property damage? Those types of things. Those four questions are the sly behaviors. The first one's on surveillance, then life invasion, interference, and intimidation. Those particular questions can help you screen in, um, in some instances, Derica. The other thing that I would suggest is to also consider using a risk assessment profile. So this risk assessment pro profile is actually called SHARP, and it stands for the Stalking, Harassment, and Risk Profile. You can find it either at coercivecontrol.org or stalkingrisk.com. Now, this isn't put out by Spark. We have worked with a researcher who came up with this. We promote it because we think it's a really great tool um, and because it's the only stalking specific risk assessment that's applicable to the United States. There's other stalking risk assessments that exist out there, but they are based in the UK or Canada. So you can't, not really great to use a risk assessment that's not based in the jurisdiction that you're using it. So Sharp will actually um, help identify some of the stalking behaviors that are happening in a stalking case as well as give us some information about safety planning. But the thing I wanna to say to you all is to remember that there's not a single tool out there, whether it's a domestic violence risk assessment or stalking risk assessment, that's better than a victim's own intuition. So remember that as you go forward. So these are just tools, but what SHARP does is actually look at 14 different risk factors. And it does two things. It gives you a narrative profile about the risk factors, and it also gives you a safety plan. So Derica, in answer to your question, going through something like SHARP with a victim might actually help you figure out what are the particular risk factors posed by this offender, and it helps you with the safety planning suggestions. Not to say that all of us aren't really great at safety planning, because we are, but oftentimes we're busy, we're under-resourced, uh, you know, we have 20 seconds with a victim before we walk into court. And so being able to have uh, like a piece of paper that we can help victims take with them if they feel comfortable doing so can be really helpful. So SHARP is free. You can do it online. You can find it at coerciveControl.org. And it goes through these 14 particular risk factors. So it identifies what's the course of conduct that's been happening in this case, including all the slide behaviors. Is there an escalation or an upcoming trigger? Court. If we're all involved, chances are there's an escalation and an upcoming trigger. Um, what are the nature and context of the threats? And is the offender capable of following through with those threats? How persistent has the offender been? So has the offender been, has there been a civil protection order or a no contact order issued and the offender keeps reoffending? Um, what's their motive to do and engage in the stalking behavior? Are they using other people? Are they engaging in proxy stalking? Do they have a history of domestic violence with the victim, with other people? Do they have guns or weapons or training? Meaning are they former military or are they former law enforcement? Do they have a criminal history, a mental health history or substance abuse history? Now keep in mind, oftentimes people look at stalking behavior and say, that's not normal. <laughs> that is not normal behavior. And people want to say, it's a mental health issue. Typically, it's a issue with power and control, not a mental health issue. So keep that in mind. Most people would engage in that behavior, but stalkers do. The other thing I want to um, help call out to you is that it's not going to be unusual to have a stalking offender who has no criminal history because they're very adept at talking their way out of things. So just because you have an offender who has zero criminal history does not mean 
but they are not capable of reoffending. Now, whether you can convince your judge and jury of that, that's going to be <laughs> another hurdle. And then how vulnerable is our victim? Um, are they in fear and what's the impact on their life? Is the offender using technology and how vulnerable are they? Do they have to live or work near the offender? Do they share custody with the offender, et cetera? So Sharp goes through those 14 risk factors and gives you the risk profile that talks about how many risk factors are present in this particular case, as well as a streamlined safety plan about the particular factors present in this case. I can tell you, I've been working with stalking victims for almost three decades, and I have never done a sharp assessment where I didn't find out something I didn't know mm -hmm. in a stalking case. And I feel like I'm pretty good at getting information in stalking cases from victims, but there's always something that's brought out that the victim hasn't mentioned or that I didn't think to ask. So this can be a really helpful scenario to draw out some of that information. We see jurisdictions across the country um, for law enforcement, sometimes they will ask those four screening questions in patrol. Um, and then if somebody has the opportunity to have a longer discussion with victims, like an investigator or a victim advocate brought in, then they're doing sharp in that scenario in the law enforcement capacity. In other capacities, victim advocates are doing this as part of a safety plan, as part of a civil protection order affidavit. Um, and in some jurisdictions, if information is being given to the prosecutor as background information that might be happening. Anything you wanna to add to that, Jen? No, I just think I mean, you hit all of that and, and well, I can kind of hit a little bit more of it when we talk about kind of investigating, but it's like such an important, important tool. Um, yeah, I'm just, you hit it all. All right. <laughs> So here we I go. like it. I like it when we not only share a uh, name, but we share a brain. It's nice. Exactly. Right? <laughs> so Jen, why don't you lead us right into those investigative strategies? So when you're thinking about investigating these cases, um, you know, uh, I would really, the one thing maybe to take away from this is what we've kind of talked about, about thinking about stalking as, you know, having that, and, you know, as a prosecutor, it was not certainly not the first crime that came to came to uh, my head when I was dealing with a case. I was looking at a case as a, it was an assault case, or it was a sexual assault case, or it was a human trafficking case, and, or it was a, you know, uh, like we've talked about, an intimate partner case, um, violence case, where it just didn't occur to me to think, oh, I have this entire uh, history of crimes that are all occurring, and, and this behavior that's occurring, um, and not only is it um, is it really helpful, which we, we'll talk about in a little bit about the prosecution about it, but it's really important to kind of think, just to kind of in your head think, okay, uh, this is a this is a crime that you can just kind of uh, I don't know I don't know how you want to how to, how you want to uh, think about it, but it but somehow I put post its up right like that's how I remember <laughs> to like to to think about certain things. So just as as you are interacting with victims in whatever capacity, think about the big picture and think about what's going on, right? Um, and so I can control slides. So, um, hold on. Oh, there we go. Okay. There's a little delay. So, um, well, you know, if you're thinking, if you're, you know, in law enforcement um, and you're thinking about investigating these cases, it's important to kind of think about, you um, you're probably not the first person that the victim is told about what's happening, right? And so like it says stalking victims have legitimate reasons for not involving the police. We've talked a little bit about some of those already, but there really is kind of this thought process that if there's not been a physical threat or if there's not been um, that behavior that truly like ultimately terrifies someone, they may not even think about going to the police and they may be scared to go to the police, right? And so once someone is actually um, uh, approaching law enforcement and talking about this, it's important to think, okay, uh, in addition to asking all those questions and to really kind of going through that risk assessment, think about who else might that person have told, right? So who else might be potential witnesses and what can be corroboration? Because um, stalkers are incredibly manipulative and incredibly um, good at what they do, which is a lot of times why they don't have that criminal record, but also things like you talked about, like, um, you know, getting flowers at work. Um, people have a tendency to think, oh, that's, how could that possibly be scary? How could that possibly be something? Um, and so you really want to think about building your case and building your investigation on 
who else has this person talked to? Have they talked to family members? Have they talked to friends? Um, have they talked to the person who does their hair? I mean, all of these things, right? Where where we think in our, you know, think about yourself, who you confide things in, um, confide in, confide things in with, with what who are your confidants, right? And so think about that as you're um going through and and talking to victims in these cases. So when they're coming to the police, most of the time, it's when they realize, as we talked about, they're being surveilled. And so that's that typical kind of behavior people think is stalking. And so a lot of times people are like, okay, this is, this is now stalking because this person's following me around. They are um, engaging in kind of that typical behavior. Um, or when that unwanted contact becomes really frightening or escalates to a different level. Um, and so, for instance, um, you know, whether... It, it, uh, I had a case where someone was was keying someone's car, right? And so, but then, um, and this this reminded me of this case actually, which I hadn't thought about in a while. But there was keying of the car, and then ultimately he broke her windshield, and that that to her was okay. This is this contact that now has escalated, and if he's doing this, what what possibly is he going to do next? And so that's the kind of trigger to reach out to law enforcement. Um, and many times. Um, victims will engage in behavior to try to avoid going to the police, right? And so they may try to placate um, that individual. Um, and they may try to, they may be scared that if they do go to the police, that it's just going to escalate things. Um, and so they've tried to kind of manage the situation as best they can, and that's just not working. And so their personal professional routines are being disrupted. And so uh, ultimately, it's kind of many times a last resort, right? Whether it's because they don't believe they don't feel that they will actually be able to get help, they don't believe someone will actually hold the offender accountable, um, or whether they don't recognize it um, as stalking until it reaches that behavior. So that's where those risk assessments are so important. And thinking about that historical basis, not only of their relationship in intimate partner cases, but also all of that, um, all of that behavior uh, that that every single piece of evidence that you can gather and it as a prosecutor and as law enforcement too the more instances you have from a practical um, purpose the more instances you're going to be able to try to corroborate and really not lay um, the foundation or the entire case on that victim right because ultimately you don't want the case to just rely on the victim for so many reasons um and and part of it is is of course, you want to have the strongest case possible, but you also want to take a lot of that pressure off the victim. So the more information you have, the more able you are as a prosecutor or in law enforcement, as a law enforcement agent, to be able to, to go out and get that additional evidence to really kind of build your case. Yeah, Jen, that reminds me of a, a case that we were working on one time, and um, the law enforcement officer was really great at gathering a bunch of information. And he had learned um, very early on that rather than him trying to determine what would be important for a prosecution, it was important to put everything in there so that the prosecutor could determine what was important for, for a prosecution. And in this particular case, what had happened um, is it was an intimate partner stalking cases. There are lots of different incidents. And um, one of the incidents that the victim had described was the power and the control that was happening in that relationship. And one of the things that the offender often made her do is every morning, he made her strip naked and weigh in every morning and he would record her weight. And when she was articulating this to, to the law enforcement officer and he was writing it down, I, part of me was like, okay, yuck. And like, but you can't convict somebody of being a jerk, but like, I'm, I'm not really sure why this is important, right? But the officer is writing this all down and it went to the prosecutor and the prosecutor brought it up in the prosecution of this case. And I was sitting in the courtroom because I was the victim advocate in this particular case. And the prosecutor brought it up um, to the jury and the victim articulated, you know, the humiliation that she went through every morning to stand up um, and have to weigh in in front of him and how he would berate her, et cetera. And I honestly think that that offender was prosecuted <laughs> and held accountable and sentenced more for that particular incident than any of the other egregious stalking incidents that he had engaged in and domestic violence education incidents here engaged in. And it was a really big aha moment for me um, early on because I was like, well, yeah, that happens in domestic violence cases. Like that's not unusual. Mm -hmm. But this officer had learned very quickly that he needed to go what 
he went beyond what he called two finger reports, which meant he could put two fingers over the report. And that was the extent of the <laughs> stalking report. And he's like, now I turn in 20 pages. And he's like, because I've learned that my prosecutor often thinks things are important that I didn't think was important. And he was exactly right in that particular case. So I think you bring up a really great point that we can't ever fail to consider the range of aspects that the offender is engaging in. And even if we don't have evidence of it all. And even if it doesn't seem like that particular incident is the egregious incident, it's really important to include in our reports. Absolutely. And um, I, I always loved it when I got more than two fingered reports. I'd never heard of that <laughs> phrase before. Um, but yes, the more information you have as a prosecutor when you're getting the case, um, you know, and a lot of times, uh, you know, you're, you're interviewing a victim multiple times, right? So a lot of times, you know, Someone who's been living, as we all know, from working with domestic violence cases or human trafficking cases, or um, there is kind of this long history of the relationship and long history of abuse. And so it's going to take, a, a, you know, multiple interviews for different reasons to really kind of get the full, um, the full story and the full um, kind of understanding of everything that's going on there. And so the more information you can put in a report and the more information you can um can put can also sometimes trigger other memories or trigger other events or trigger other thoughts um, for the victim um, later. And a trigger is not the best word there, but might but it helps them sometimes um, remember everything that that goes along and and something like that, right? That's clearly con controlling behavior, and it really goes towards showing, um, you know, the defendant's intent and what they what they were. Um, what they were really kind of their, while as prosecutors, we know we don't have to prove motive. Motive is really important in, in all the cases and the jury is going to want it. So the more you can kind of, the more information you have about, wow, why was he engaging in this behavior? He's been engaging in this type of behavior for control for so long. And so a lot of that is really important for a jury to, to hear. Um, and so uh, on your sticky note too, where you're also thinking about trafficking or sorry, thinking about um, stalking, you're thinking about describing, documenting, and contextualizing when you're thinking about an investigation. So you're thinking about, um, you want to describe, you obviously, you you want um, all of those individual incidents, but you really want to kind of think about it as this big picture, right? And so it's this all falling under this big umbrella of stalking. Um, and to be able to describe that kind of overall behavior, particular to whatever this offender is doing, right? And so... Uh, to do that, you're going to really need to document everything you can. Um, and it's really important to document. And, and we've talked about um, showing that fear and that harm, like with that spider video, right? Until you have, until you're, and you need to document all of that um, because even the smallest things. So even, you know, someone's demeanor when they're talking to you about um, an incident that's happened is so important. And putting that in a police report is really, really important. Um, because as a, you know, in law enforcement, you may not, you know, you're, everyone is like we've discussed, no one is over-resourced, right? Everyone is, is scrambling all the time and handling, um, millions of things at once. And so you might not remember six or eight or however many months down the road, um, depending on how long, you know, cases take to, to kind of go to come to fruition and go to trial. Um, you might not remember, um, that the victim was crying or that they were shaking or that you noticed they became pale. And so all of these things about demeanor are really important to document in your, in your reports as well. Um, and, uh, you know, not making the victim was scared. Well, what does that mean? Um, it, did they articulate that they were scared, but also what did you notice about their behavior? Um, and then contextualizing it. So again, why was, um, you know, why was that woman scared of the spider, right? I mean, I think of two of like um, Sleeping with the Enemy, that movie when, you know, just the towels are perfectly, um, you know, perfectly organized and level and the cans are all in a perfect place, right? So what's the contextual basis behind that? And then when you're thinking about um, interacting with victims in these cases, think about exactly that first contact is, is so critical, right? And so keeping in mind too, that, um, that it may have taken a lot for this individual to be able to come to law enforcement and to, they're taking a really big leap of faith um, and, and they're putting a lot of trust 
in the system and, and in this interaction with you. And so, like you said earlier, Jen, you may, your interaction with that individual, whether if it's, well, I, you know, even if you're conveying like, oh, this seems a little bit, you know, this seems crazy or this seems whatever, like this is not behavior that, that you, you're like, oh, you're, you, you're victim blaming as opposed to kind of really kind of taking that step back and really listening to the individual you're speaking with. And so kind of that, that first interaction and that first contact is really critical in, in making sure that that individual trusts um, what's happening um, and tr is going to trust, you know, the system because it's, it really is um, a system that's really difficult to go through as a victim, as, as those of you who work with victims understand for sure. Um, and so if someone's coming to law enforcement, it's really an opportunity to, to, to interact with that individual such that they will trust you and such that they will disclose um, what's been happening to them. Um, and so you're able to really hold that offender accountable. Um, have resources available. So know where, um, know what those resources are in your, um, in your area, right? Um, so much of providing individuals with support um, through the process is is knowing who to connect them with and knowing and really providing kind of those meaningful services like we talked about. What what do you need now? What are those things that that we can help you with? And connecting them with individuals who really can do that, um, who can do that well. Think about preserving evidence at the time. So for example, take photos of those text messages because they may, for some reason, not show up in a, if you do ultimately do a search warrant or so if, uh, if you're subpoenaing um, phone records. Um, it's important to have those to preserve as much evidence as possible um, initially. And then think about preparing for the long haul, right? So again, like you talked about with that officer who is really diligent in creating their reports, um, to putting that information in those reports is, is really important, whether it's important in that initial prosecution or whether it becomes important in a later prosecution. I think one of the things that we oftentimes um, <laughs> fail to think about when we think about our relationships between our offenders and our victims is establishing like what was normal in that relationship. And I was the example, um, both of my uh, young adult daughters are in relationships, unfortunately. And if they were to get text messages or Snapchats, because they don't actually send text messages because they're young people. If one of them were to tell me I got five snaps today from my partner, I'd be like, only five snaps? Like, wow, like how does that happen. And the, if the other one said, I got five snaps today, I'd be like, that person needs to leave me alone. Like, why are they sending you so many snaps, right? So if we don't know what kind of contact was typical in that particular relationship, we can't establish like the baseline of what is normal, right? The other thing that we also need to be thinking about is a lot of times in stalking cases, the offender's excuse is, I didn't know the contact was unwanted, or mm -hmm. I was just trying to get back together with this person. I wanted my stuff back. I wanted to talk to my kids, et cetera. And one of the things that happens in a lot of stalking cases is people kind of put the onus on victims to say, here's the clear line in the sand. I don't want to have any contact with you anymore. And then to stick with that clear line in the sand. And so some state statutes require that the victim has to tell the offender to stop. But one of the things that we need to be thinking about is some victims, and you kind of alluded to this earlier, Jen, some victims actually engage with the offender as a means of safety planning. They're doing like a temperature check. So obviously we don't want to find out about that when the victim's on the stand and the defense says, well, if the victim was really so scared, why did they call my, you know, my client 20 times last month? It would be helpful to know that before the victim's on the stand. But Absolutely. one of the things that we often do is Put this onus on victims to completely disengage and that's not either realistic nor okay because in a lot of instances victims are oftentimes maintaining contact with the offender because they're trying to mitigate the effects of the stalking and especially if the offender is an intimate partner so be thinking about that as we go forward and the other thing that we need to be thinking about is establishing that context in that relationship to ask, you know, has the relationship changed? What, how has it changed? Are we looking at an escalation? How would you describe the relationship? This question seems a little like, well, why would we ask that? I was one time in an interview where we were asking the victim, you know, how would you describe your relationship with the suspect? And she's like, well, you know, we kind of had mutual friends. We've hung out at college parties before, you know, we know each other. I wouldn't even say we were dating. 
And when we asked the offender the same question, the offender said, I was going to ask her to marry me this Christmas. A little bit different opinion there. <laughs> Very insightful as to what is that relationship like, right? The other thing that we need to be thinking about is when we have a victim coming forward, asking questions about how the contact made them feel, et cetera. One of the things that sometimes we see people struggle with is in absence of a victim articulating that they feel fear. Some victims, especially male victims, won't say I'm afraid of the offender, especially if it's a female offender and they're a male victim. Some female victims are like, if they show up, I'm gonna greet them at the door with a weapon and I'm gonna do blah, blah. And we're like, ooh, I don't know about putting that person on the stand. One of the questions that I've found extremely helpful in stalking cases is to ask victims, what has changed for you since the stalking started? And in the absence oftentimes of a victim articulating fear, they will say things like, I don't sleep at night. I don't eat the same. I cannot work day shift anymore because I don't like sleeping at night. So I only have to work night shift. Um, you know, I don't let my kids play out in the front yard alone. I don't go to their baseball games anymore. Those particular changes in behavior can often also help you meet the state standards that you, the statutes that you, standards that you might meet for emotional distress and for fear. So asking victims what has changed for them since the stalking happened can also be a really trauma-informed question and opens up to a lot of different things that have changed for the victim as a result of the offender's behavior. Also thinking about for the respondents, for the offenders, um, asking, you know, about the contacts that you've had with the victim, how are they sent? One of the things that oftentimes happens is when offender sends a text message or something to a victim and the victim doesn't respond, the offender sends 35 more text messages or calls 900 more times. And so asking questions about like, when you're normally conversing with somebody and you don't get a text message back, do you continue to send 35 messages? Why only with Jen would you continue to send 35 more messages when you're not getting a response? Um, and asking them, you know, why did you continue the contact if the contact ceased on their end? Or what kind of response were you hoping for? What was your goal here? One of the things that a lot of offenders will say, especially to law enforcement, is this is just a big misunderstanding. If you would just let me have five minutes to work this out with a victim, then I promise nobody's going to call you out again. I promise we'll make it happen, et cetera. I've seen offenders pull this stunt in court and say, you know, if we just had five minutes and judges who have been like, okay, we'll take a five minute recess so the parties can try. To... No, no, please. <laughs> okay. We have to remember that anytime the offender has contact with the victim, it reinforces their behavior. So in that conversation with victims about it's ideal if you can draw the line in the sand and not have contact with the offender, because if they call you 37 times and you answer on the 38th time, even if you tell them to jump off a cliff, the offender is going to call back 38 times the next time. So it's ideal if we don't have any contact. And if there is contact, we just need to know what that was about. Did you call the offender because you were doing that temperature check? It's not something a prosecutor can't work around, but they need to know it ahead of time, right? Absolutely. Also thinking about how are we documenting that particular fear and harm? And I wanna read you this particular uh, police report that came in. And this victim says that on this particular uh, day they were driving their car and they had a funny feeling and stopped the car and tried to open the trunk and they weren't able to. And she couldn't determine why it wasn't opening. The previous evening, the suspect entered her residence uninvited wearing the same tuxedo from their wedding he wears when he follows her around town. The suspect snuck into the bedroom crying and apologizing, told her the reason she wasn't able to get into the trunk was because he was in it and that he was holding the trunk door shut to prevent her from accessing it. She said earlier today, she looked inside the trunk and found a pillow and a string tied to the trunk door and that string appeared to allow the suspect to secure it and open it when needed. Now, when I'm reading this particular police report to you and you're looking at the full context of everything that's been happening, my experience has been that while most of us are like, ooh, about the trunk, people are even more like, what? When it says that he wears the same tuxedo that they got married in around town when he follows her. Now, had a thorough trauma-informed interview not been done, chances are they would not have included this in the particular police report. And we have a lot of behaviors that have been happening here, including potential breaking and entering, all those things about accessing the vehicle, et cetera. And one of the things that we want to be able to consider when we're trying to document fear and harm 
is to look at the range of behaviors that have been happening, not just physical harm of he was in my trunk, but the psychological harm of he keeps showing up around town in the same tuxedo he got married in. So thinking about that as we go forward and understanding that there's a range of behaviors that have been happening, and oftentimes in stalking cases, people have a tendency to focus on the physical harm that has been happening because we think that's connected to the crime, but building the entire context like is put in this particular report, I can, can't imagine any jury looking at this particular police report and not having the same reaction that we see everyone have when we read this particular report out loud. And, and as a prosecutor too, that's a great piece of evidence when you're having the defendant say there was some legit, you, you, you alluded a little bit to having a legitimate purpose to contact the victim, right? That's a defense and it, it, you know, it becomes a pseudo defense. Like I had a legitimate purpose in following this or seeing this person in town or, or seeing this person wherever, but it's really hard to argue that you had a legitimate purpose in wearing your wedding tuxedo around every single time uh, you saw that individual. So that goes, um, that's really, really great evidence um, to kind of negate that uh, at, at a trial. Absolutely. As well as evidence for fear when we talk about what accommodations has the victim made? Have they gotten a civil protection order? Do they now have a dog? Do they have they installed a camera? Um, have they asked people at work to screen phone calls? Because that's also potential witnesses that could come in and say, yeah, since this has been happening, Jenna's asked me to start screening their phone calls that come, come in. Everything's sent to voicemail or we no longer post their schedule online, et cetera, because we're worried somebody might show up there. Helping victims um, articulate why certain contacts scared them. I think one of the things that is sometimes missed in stalking crimes is we forget that fear can be retroactive. And by that I mean, so say for instance, the victim broke up with the offender and the offender sends flowers that says, I will always love you right after they broke up. And the victim's like, you know, get a life, move on, throws the flowers in the trash can, right? And then the offender starts showing up at their gym and then they start calling work all the time, and then they start doing all these other things. When the offender initially sent the flowers after breakup, chances are the victim wasn't like, oh, this is a potential stalking case, I should run and make a police report. But now given everything else that has happened, they might look back at that first incident and be like, oh, that was actually the first incident that has happened in this particular, in this particular situation. And for prosecutors who are looking at adding stalking charges, et cetera, to domestic violence charges or other particular crimes, keep in mind that in stalking cases, we often expand the amount of information that we can get in as evidence because we can go back to the very first incident that happened in that course of conduct. Whereas in domestic violence or other particular crimes, we might be limited about the amount of information we get in about the offender. And so we see lots of prosecutors are very strategic in adding a stalking charge in with the domestic violence because suddenly now those prior bad acts that were difficult to get in earlier or required some hoops to jump through are now suddenly present because we added the stalking charge and we can go back six months, 10 months because the stalking behavior has been happening all the time. And I think it's really important to understand that in a lot of these stalking situations, there may be some incidents that happen that are fear inducing to those of us that were like, that's scary, that a victim might be like, mm, it happened all the time. Or there might be incidents that have happened that don't seem like a big deal to us that are a big deal to the victim. And so keeping in mind that it, the more information that we're gathering, so asking those open in, ended trauma informed questions like, you know, how did that experience make you feel? What has it been like for you? What have you done to try to protect yourself? How's your life changed as a result of the stalking? What did you think was gonna happen if you didn't make these changes? All those changes in a victim's routine and their everyday life patterns can help us articulate the fear element that we're often needed in these particular situations, as well as things like changing accounts, if they've spent money on finances. We know the average victim spends about $1,000 in safety procedures to try to protect themselves from a stalking offender. So keeping in mind things like, you know, identity theft and changing addresses and buying cameras, all those things can also help us articulate and give us evidence. And don't forget about our potential witnesses. A lot of times people say, well, there aren't really witnesses in stalking crimes because it's usually just the offender and the victim. 
but asking those people at work, did they ask him to screen calls? Are there different places like daycare or school or an apartment building that the victim has asked to keep an eye out for, for the offender or who has communicated with the victim? Um, I oftentimes find uh, that witnesses in stalking cases are somebody that the victim was Snapchat videoing with or was on a FaceTime call with that I don't think of to mention as witnesses because they weren't there in person. They were just, just on a video call. So be thinking about those potential um, uh, witnesses, as well as making sure that when we try to contextualize the threat that's posed by this particular offender, giving an accurate picture of what this offender is like beyond just their criminal history. Because like we mentioned, that might be empty, but what's their tech experience? What kind of education and background ha do they have? Have they followed through on previous threats? Um, are there substance abuse issues that are at play here as well? can help paint a better picture for the judge and jury in these particular cases, as well as the fact, you know, do they have a history of protection order violations, um, history of vandalism and trespassing. Um, we often see that if there is a criminal history, there's a lot of property crimes, um, identity theft, the petty crimes that people think aren't as important to mention because they're not crimes against persons, but absolutely give us a more accurate picture of what our offender is like. And of escalation, right? If someone is, if someone is, you know, escalating from property crimes to threats of more physical harm, um, that's really important to note too. Absolutely, as well as articulating how detailed the threats are. I mean, I, I can say that I haven't ever worked with a single victim of stalking or domestic violence whose partner hasn't threatened to kill them, but I'm going to kill you versus, you know, I'm going to put a bullet in the side of your head and bury you behind grandma's shed. Those very specific detailed threats are really important for us to articulate because it shows motive and intent of the offender and the more specific the threat, the more danger our victim is in. So keeping that in mind as well. And then Jen, you wanna talk a little bit more about using some of those investigative strategies to prosecute? Sure, and so just as an overview and like we've kind of said, um, you know, this, all stalking statutes are very different by jurisdiction. There's a ton of case law that defines all these different elements and, and, um, certain states require different, you know, certain elements. And so we can really help you with any kind of, if you have jurisdiction specific questions, we can help you with that. So feel free to reach out. Um, and I know there's not a ton of prosecutors on the call today, but, it's really helpful, I think, for anybody working in these um, in this area to kind of be thinking about what might end up landing on a prosecutor's desk, or what if you're working with victims and you see um, these types of behaviors, kind of understanding what you know a prosecutor might be thinking or looking for, or understanding those laws can be really helpful in you kind of assessing um, involving you know whether. It's just always good to know, and and you're going to be really a source of a lot of information. Like you said, Jen, you know, you were in a, you, you were you're not a prosecutor, but you were speaking with and working with a lot of these victims, um, and learning so much information from them, and so um, and can be a really great support system through uh, through a prosecution and through um, through that process. So. You know, I'm not going to do too deep a dive into all of these elements, but it's worth, you know, kind of touching on them. So we, we all kind of understand that while jurisdictions will differ, generally we're looking at a pattern of behavior or like, like you said, a course of conduct is a lot of times what's discussed that is directed at a person that has an impact on a person. So those are kind of just when you really kind of simplify it as much as you possibly can, these are kind of the, the four things we're looking at. Um, and we can talk, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about each of those just so you have a little bit of a framework. But I would also say, um, in addition to, so when you're thinking about, you know, charging stalking as, as um, a crime, like you, like you said earlier, Jen, it really, it gives, it is a very powerful tool as a prosecutor to really hold an offender accountable for the full weight of their crimes. Um, and to, you know, uh, always one of the, one of the, as a, as a prosecutor, I wish I'd thought about stalking more often, right? Because you're getting this entire history in a domestic violence case or in a human trafficking case. Um, and you're getting this history and, and you may be charging, for instance, I had a, 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 a really pretty, um, not that they're not all awful, but um, I had a, um, a case where the, 
there was a really significant instance of violence. It was a, a horrific sexual assault um, on the victim by her husband after they'd been together for 10 years. And so it, there were minor instances of violence, but then he he bound and, and gagged her and sexually assaulted her. Um, and uh, it was a really pretty um, aggressive, a very, very aggressive physical assault and sexual assault. Um, and prior to that, there had been 10 years of maybe a push here and there, but it really was a departure. But then when we looked back and talked to her about their relationship, there was a ton of behavior that was not criminal, but that gave a lot of context for um, the controlling behavior that then finally the defendant in this case just snapped um, and and really was using this as this physical and sexual assault as an ultimate means to try to control the victim. But when you look at all of that behavior, um, that leads up to it, of course, you want a jury to hear about that. Of course, you want that all to come in because you want the jury to understand that relationship. And because we charged the specific incidents on this, you know, this, this one date, um, we then were limited to going to a judge and saying, we need all of these other, this 10 years of, of evidence to come in for a jury to understand. So you're, you're, it, you know, in New York, we call it Molyneux evidence, right? And so, but it's that prior bad acts evidence and subsequent bad acts, but you're really at the mercy of a judge. And so if, as a prosecutor, you can take that out of a judge's hands and charge the stalking and you can have those behaviors as, as the context, you do not have to worry about that. And it takes, you know, something uh, off of your plate and really you'll have a better understanding of, of what the jury is going to hear um, and so, of course, there's a billion reasons why you don't want to just leave it to, to a judge to determine. Um, and that's just one instance of many that I wish I had thought about stalking. So hopefully, um, those of you who are still uh, working as prosecutors will be able to, to take this, put that sticky up there and think about it. Um, but when we're talking about pattern of behavior, just to kind of discuss it a little bit, it's a course of conduct that's going to depend um, on the jurisdiction you're in, how long that course of conduct is, and or how many incidents are required. Um, and some jurisdictions say there needs to be a continuity of purpose. And so that's a little bit more difficult to kind of articulate, especially if you have instances that are separated by a larger amount of time. And so think in those cases, maybe where is there a reason why there, you know, there was a chunk of time in between incidents, right? Was the victim able to hide from the um, offender for a significant amount of time? And, and so just look for those, it all goes back to asking those questions about what was going on um, during that time frame. And like we've talked about, the, the instances do not have to be illegal, right? So sending flowers to someone or, um, uh, or you know, calling them at work, just phone calls, right? Phone calls are not necessarily illegal, except that they can rise to that level. And you can also think about charging separate instances as separate crimes, right? Um, and then as we talked about that no legitimate purpose, so sometimes you have to show there was no legitimate purpose for this behavior. And so um, really that's where you're gonna get, um, when you get into all those contextualizing questions, you really have all that information from, um, from the individual to be able to kind of counterbalance those, um, whether it's an actual defense or whether it's just um, you know one that's raised by a defense attorney um, in their questioning of the victim, you kind of have all that information so you can attack that there was really no legitimate purpose. Um, so Cassandra, using prior bad acts, do you need the victim to testify or is there a way around that? So many times it's prior bad acts with that victim. And so you will have the victim will be testifying and they can testify as to a lot of that other behavior. Um, sometimes there are witnesses or other evidence of that um, prior behavior that you can, um, so that again comes in handy when you're talking about, you know, what, were there any other witnesses or was there anybody that that individual told about that prior instance of violence or those prior threats? So kind of thinking creatively about who might know something. Um, a lot of times if you have a victim who's able to cooperate, uh, who's able to participate in the um, process, um, and is is able to testify at trial, you're bringing a lot of that out through that individual, but there are ways um, around it. We can discuss that more. 
um, at a later date if you want to contact me. Um, and then we're also thinking about um, just something to think about in terms of directed at an individual, right? So you have to have this, this impact on this individual. And so most of the time it's going to be um, it's going to be contact or communications or with that actual individual. But as we've discussed, it could be third party or it could be um, it could be uh, acts um, towards that person's employer or towards their family members, right? Like so approaching a family member or um, there and any acts that are toward to a um, even if it's to another person that's not the victim, but if it is meant to elicit a reaction in that victim or intended to impact that victim, it's really important to think about what other, um, that, that, that all counts and that can all be charged and that's all instances. It doesn't have to be directed, it doesn't have to be approaching that victim on the street, it could be approaching their friend and saying something that um, is intended to get back to that uh, individual. So, and many times that's also, really great corroboration, right? So think about charging that and having that be part of the um, the stalking behavior because then you're calling that victim or that friend and that's an additional corroboration. Um, and so again, this, this really is gonna vary by jurisdiction, this impact. So whether it's intent to annoy, to harass, to instill fear, to embarrass or cause severe emotional distress or any and all of the above. Um, this will be uh, enumerated in your jurisdictional statutes, but thinking about what that impact is. And again, most of the time it doesn't have to be um, uh, threats or outward behaviors that uh, physical and menacing threats. And, and so that's where that context really comes into play to think about all of these impacts that it's having. Um, and again, it's gonna vary by your jurisdiction. Sometimes it's uh, based on a reasonable person in that victim's position, or sometimes it's subjective. So you have to prove that that actual individual um, was in fear, uh, was embarrassed, was harassed. And so it just kind of, you just need to take a look at that and, um, and um, move appropriately. So we kind of talk about having this prosecution toolbox. We've discussed a lot of this already. Um, but really think about it, especially in intimate partner cases, which I saw in the chat many of you work on. So think about that. Um, think about stalking in those cases. Um, and use those risk assessments. We talked about all the reasons why they're really great for investigations. They're also really great for as a tool for a prosecutor, um, not just in the investigation phase, but in providing um, arguments for possible pretrial detention, right? Or so, uh, and to... Um, uh, ask for those protective orders. So many times prosecutors can ask for criminal protective order as part of a case. Um, in sentencing, right? So you have a lot of background information and, and information for a judge when you're making arguments for a sentence. Or if you're thinking about if someone is going to be on parole or, or under in uh, supervised probation. So a lot of the information you get from that can be also, again, shared and used with um, with you know, properly with parole um, and probation in terms of setting some of those um, uh, conditions. Um, you also, again, want to just, we've said this a bunch, but really just think about meaningful services and making sure that you're supporting a victim through, um, through a prosecution, right? That's not just, um, you know, prosecutor's role is not just to, to be, okay, what charges do we have? Let's get this done. This is what we're doing. You're also really supporting that victim through the process and connecting them with, with the people who are able to do that. Um, and then like we talked about, um, uh, again, if you're, if you're charging stalking, hopefully you're not having to, to file motions to introduce a lot of this other bad act evidence. Um, but in an instance, for instance, where maybe, uh, um, there's a, an underlying assault case and then that individual starts taking, um, the defendant starts taking and that's been charged and the defendant then starts making actions and doing things to intimidate that victim and to um, try to get them to not go forward with the case or whatever it may be, you may have a separate 
stalking and witness intimidation case. So you want to make sure you're thinking about introducing that prior assault case as a as a prior bad act to show that 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 the defendant's behavior was meant to intimidate the witness and and um, that there was no legitimate purpose. And then, so while we are of course, advocating all sorts of uh, advocating for you to really think about charging stalking and, and charging it a lot. There are also a lot of other charges that can go along with stalking. And so these are just a few of them. But when you think about it, it might, you know, depending on your statute, um, what you have may not rise to the level of stalking, or you may not be able to prove it for whatever reasons. So think about some of these other crimes, um, whether there's a violation of an order of protection. Um, you may have, um, again, like like we saw in that in that prior case, I think with the tuxedo, that was a, a, a I would argue a pretty good stalking case. Um, but you do have also the burglary and the theft. And so think about um, think about that. If there's instances of animal cruelty, um, unfortunately, a lot of times we see pets that are used in in stalking. Um, and so if you like animals like I do, that's the unfortunate. Um, and so just think about these other crimes that you could possibly charge as well. And then just to continue with the prosecutor's toolbox, think about admitting expert testimony to kind of help explain um, why some of that behavior of a victim may seem counterintuitive to a jury, right? Um, many times a victim's going to be very able to explain on the stand why they were maybe contacting the, the defendant, right? Why they were still engaging with the defendant. That doesn't mean it's not stalking. It just, and it doesn't mean that they weren't in fear, in fact, a lot of times, some of that evidence that you know we want to know about and and not have has surprise on the stand. A lot of times, that's really good evidence to prove the stalking, right? So, what's going on in the victim's head that they're still? Well, why are you still contacting that individual? I was terrified that if I didn't respond to that text message, or if I didn't, that it would get worse, or if I changed my phone number, he would just you know he would go after my family or whatever it might be. All of that can be really, really, really powerful evidence in your case. So don't be afraid of, of that evidence that sometimes seems like bad evidence. Um, again, think about protective orders and think about, um, think about uh, we've talked about the protective orders a little bit. There's civil and criminal, but um, support that. And then um, think about forfeiture by wrongdoing. So this I'll just touch on very briefly. But as a prosecutor, if, if that defendant has then engaged in behavior, that has caused that victim to be unable to testify at the trial. If you prove that the witness is unavailable, you prove that it's because of the defendant's acts. And again, wrongdoing, we have we have a lot of uh, resources on this, so we can help a lot with this forfeiture by wrongdoing. But you're able to get these statements in if you can prove these, you can, you're able to get prior statements of the victim in. Um, as a hearsay exception, and you don't have to worry about Crawford and confrontation clause if you can prove these things, that the witness was unavailable, that the defendant's wrongdoing caused it, and that the defendant intended that that witness be unavailable. Um, and there's all sorts of, uh, there's all sorts of um, uh, case law about this, but it doesn't necessarily have to be threats, and it doesn't have to be the only reason that the individual um, doesn't come to court. But this is a really great tool to think about if you have these cases um, where the stalker is very good at their job and um, and is able to convince uh, a victim um, not to come to court. Um, and again, this is just the last plug that really surrounding the victim is this team of individuals and we all play, everyone in these roles plays a really, really important um, part in ensuring that a victim is um, getting what they need and and getting justice, whatever that looks like for them. Um, and especially in stalking cases where there is um, that entire history and so much going on that it really takes everybody to respond. And this is one of the resources. We do have a prosecutor's guide to stalking. It's a really great resource um, available on our website. Yeah, and Emma's been doing a really great job about linking some of those law enforcement and prosecution resources. Um, thank you, Emma, for being on with us. Thank you. Um, and just to wrap up, just a reminder where you can find a lot of this information on our uh, website, which is stalkingawareness.org. I also linked for you and will link for you um, the Equitas website, or Emma can do that for us real quick. Um, remember that we're all one organization, so uh, we're available whether you reach out to Jen uh, or I, we'll make sure that we loop in the other one 
um, to get you the resources and the help that you need. So please reach out to us. I know that I speak on behalf of Jen that I wanna thank you all very much for spending the last 90 minutes with us. We know um, that you have a lot to do and we appreciate that you chose to spend those 90 minutes with us and thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the work that you do every single day to increase the safety of the victims in these particular cases and to hold these offenders accountable. So thank you so much um, and have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you everybody.